Heritage Baptist Church. Take your songbooks if you would. Turn to number 341. 341. Let's stand together as we sing Victory in Jesus. Number 341. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How He gave His life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about His groaning Of His precious blood's atoning Then I repented of my sin And won the victory Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with His redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew Him, and all my love is to Him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Get around, welcome each other this evening. Join with me on that second stanza on the second. Here we go. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me and I knew him, and all my love is to Plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. And on the last, I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea, about the angels singing and the old redemption story. And someday I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all oh, my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Great singing tonight. If you need your Bibles, turn to Psalm 34. Psalms 34. He that dwelleth in... No, that's Psalm 91. Um, I sought the Lord. Sorry, I sought the Lord. <laughs> I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and take him out of all his trouble. 
round about them that fear him and delivereth them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth. Brother Tim is doing scripture songs from his living Bible tonight, and uh, entirely different words. Well, good evening. Well, Lynn, glad you're here. Good evening. There you go. I'm glad to see you. I appreciate the Wednesday night crowd. Of course, it's vacation season, and we've got a lot of folks gone, uh, but we've got, uh, we actually have people visiting tonight. We got Pastor and Mrs. Aaron McCullough and their family from New Jersey. Some the ladies remember uh, Mrs. McCullough. Uh, she's actually preaching tonight, and uh, so uh, but she's a, a regular fixture at our ladies' conference. And they're uh, on the you're on your way back home. They've been on vacation. They run a camp, uh, Camp Aura in New Jersey, and uh, they had about five weeks of that and said we need some relaxation. So they were up. Uh, in Maine, and it's good to have them with us here tonight. Uh, I know you got a prayer list. We'll go over that in, in, in a little bit at the end of the service. We'll be praying for Micheline Clack's family. Uh, her, uh, her aunt, I don't think it's on the list, her aunt Colette Trepan, Trepanier. Is that close enough? It's French. Um, she, uh, she was just diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. She, somebody, a nurse or somebody saw her and, and said, your, your skin color's off, and they tested it. Uh, she's got pancreatic cancer, and they're only giving her about two months to live. And uh, my understanding, they just found this out. So pray for Micheline's family, if you would. And, and I'll try to remind you that at, at prayer request time, uh, to uh, write that on your prayer list, uh, if you would. I'm glad you're here. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we can be in church here in the middle of the week. Lord, uh, our, our world has just gone haywire and I listen to a little bit of the news and just turn it off after a while. I'm glad I've got a place that I can come and the news is always good and it's always right because it's your news. It's the word of God that liveth and abideth forever. Lord, thank you for these folks. They've worked hard all day, some out in the heat and humidity. Thank you for keeping our people safe. Uh, Lord, bless our time together. Bless the Patch the Pirate Club. Bless the Spanish service tonight. Uh, and Lord, I pray that you'd help us to understand the Bible, open our eyes, that we may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Lord, we do pray for Micheline's aunt and uh, just ask you to, to touch this dear lady. I, I don't know where she's at spiritually, if she knows the Lord or not. Uh, Lord, if she's not saved, Lord, please allow some Christians, some godly people to cross paths with her and share Christ. If she is saved, Lord, just draw her close and give comfort to her and the family. Be with Micheline. Uh, Lord, as uh, she uh, carries this burden on her heart of someone that she loves. We could continue, of course, to pray for Gary Bonarowski going through uh, everything, getting ready for the stem cell transplant and just keep him healthy, keep him safe through this process over the next few weeks. Lord, bless tonight as we meet together and we'll thank you for this. We ask for it in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Um, ushers, in, in the back, we should have some of the... Uh, Amendments to the Constitution. If you are a member of our church and were not here on Sunday night and did not get one of these, would you raise your hand? Okay, we got it. We got a couple scattered around. Uh, we are uh, proposing an amendment to the church constitution. Uh, this is coming by recommendation of Christian Law Association and the National uh, uh, Center for Christian Law, um, and uh, they are encouraging us to shore up our, our verbiage when it comes to the subject of human sexuality, especially now because of the transgender issue. Isn't it sad we gotta talk about that at church? Uh, but uh, for example, the state of Iowa has already passed legislation that is designed to force churches uh, to allow men to use ladies' restrooms and vice versa if that just happens to be how they're identifying themselves. Uh, so uh, what, you, what you see on this, we went through it Sunday night. If you have any questions, you can see me about it. Uh, the top paragraph is, is uh, how our Constitution stands uh, currently. The bottom, uh, you'll see a, a paragraph in italics is that which we are recommending that we add to that. Uh, both CLA and uh, the uh, National Center for Christian Law are saying that if, if we ever have an issue, somebody challenges us because uh, we, we require men to use men's restrooms and so forth, uh, and God forbid we should ever have to go to court, if, if we've got it in our constitution and our statement of faith, uh, we, are, we are better protected. And so next Wednesday evening at the end of the service, we'll have a brief 
uh, uh, business meeting to go over that. And again, if you have any questions on that, please see me. I'll be glad to answer those for you. Um, this coming Saturday morning, 10 o'clock, we'll be going out soul winning. This has been an amazing summer. Uh, it has been the best season of uh, soul winning that we have had uh, in a long, long time. And uh, usually between 20 and 30 folks out, almost all adults going out soul winning. Uh, we meet here in the auditorium at 10 o'clock. We're here for about a half hour. We pair up and go out. Uh, some go out for an hour or so. Some go out for several hours. It depends on your schedule, what you can do. Uh, if you've never gone before, teenagers, you are encouraged to come. Uh, be a part of this. We'll pair you up with someone that knows what they're doing. And uh, God certainly blessed us. We've seen people saved every week for months and months and months. And uh, we want to see that continue. So join us, uh, if you would, Saturday morning at 10 o'clock. Uh, this coming Tuesday at 7 o'clock is our ladies' missionary prayer meeting. It'll be here at the church, downstairs in the Filipino chapel. If you have any questions on that, uh, you can see Micheline Clack, and she'll answer those for you. And just so you know, tonight is the last night of the Kids Summer Bible Club. Uh, we'll be getting ready, gearing up to go back to school, and we'll be starting the next session of Patch the Pirate Clubs. Uh, so next week, we'll have everybody back in here for a week or so, uh, and then we'll start saying goodbye to our college kids as they head back to school again. And uh, so moms and dads, that, that doesn't mean you don't go to church because there's nothing for kids. There is something for kids. It's called the Bible study. And uh, so you just be here, but I want you to be aware uh, not, not to uh, take your kids downstairs next week because nobody else will be there. And I think that's all the announcements. Brother Tim, come lead us another song. Turn to number 407 in your songbook. 407, Jesus is the sweetest name I know. 407. There have been names that I had loved to hear, but never has there been a name so dear to this heart of mine as the name divine, the precious, precious name of Jesus. Jesus is the sweetest name I know, and he's just the same. They, this prayer request for uh, Micheline's mom just came in this afternoon, and uh, Brother Dave just uh, sent the update up here. Uh, she's taking a turn for the worst. Uh, she is a saved lady. It looks like she might be going out into eternity tonight. Uh, so this is really, really fast for that family to deal with. Uh, how many know who Dr. Earl Jessup is? Uh, Dr. Jessup is one of America's prolific church planters. He helped Brother Zacharias start the church in Brantford uh, 17 years ago. And we got a letter from him 
uh, last week uh, that just said he's battled cancer for a number of years. He said, uh, the doctors are telling me, he said, I, I've probably just got a few weeks to live, and the next day he passed away. Uh, so a uh, lot, of, lot of sad folks dealing with things, so uh, just be praying for that family. Thank you for your faithfulness. Last Sunday was a, just a tremendous day financially. It was a tremendous day all around. Uh, there were, uh, I think, four, four or five saved on Sunday. They had two saved down in the Spanish uh, service on Sunday. Uh, offerings were very good, made up for the one uh, the week before. Uh, thank you for that in the summertime. Continue to be faithful uh, in those things. Brother Dave, would you lead us in prayer tonight for the offering? Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, God, we thank you um, for loving us, Lord. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for the blood of Jesus and um, Micheline's aunt, Lord. She knows you as her Savior, Lord, and I thank you for that. But I do pray for the family uh, that is there uh, now. I pray to you just wrap your arms around them you know, during this time. And Lord, I ask you to bless uh, the offering, Lord, I pray that you'd use it, multiply it, Lord, for your glory. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Bibles, please, and turn to Exodus chapter number 19. We've been studying the names of God this summer on our Wednesday nights, and uh, tonight is uh, what I think personally is the most unusual name for God in the Bible. Uh, as I've mentioned, uh, by, by my best count, there are 210 different names for God given throughout both the Old and the New Testaments. Uh, we've, we've talked about probably a dozen or so of them uh, at this point. And uh, tonight, like I said, we're going to talk about one of the most unusual ones, but it's going to take us a while to get there. We're going to do the study a, a bit differently. Uh, we're going to just do a, a little bit of a journey uh, through the scriptures, if you will, please. Uh, the book of Exodus, of course, is the story of how Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt. Uh, they have, uh, by chapter 19, uh, they have crossed the Red Sea. And uh, then Pharaoh's army was drowned after them. Uh, God has begun sending the manna to them. And so every day uh, God is feeding them. They have water coming out of the rock. Uh, they have a pillar of cloud above them every day that is, is literally the presence of the Lord in their midst. At night that turns into a pillar of fire. And uh, they, they follow that when God wants them to move. They all pack up all their stuff, you know, two million people out in the wilderness, and they just follow that pillar. Uh, in the daytime, the cloud gives them shade. In the nighttime, it provides light for them. So these people are seeing the miraculous on a constant basis. The presence of God is made known to them. Uh, you got to understand, when we come to chapter 19, there has been no Bible written down yet in human history. Uh, it's about to happen uh, in the book of Exodus for the first time, but, but they don't have Bibles to open them. So everything they know about God uh, is that which he has revealed to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and so forth, uh, and now through Moses, and they're beginning their journeys. According to verse 1 of chapter 19, in the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. So only three months have passed since the Red Sea. And, and this is all important. This is all going somewhere. So, so uh, I, I'm not trying to numb your mind with details, but it's, it's just very important. It's only been three months. In three months, everything should be fresh in their minds. Am I right? I mean, they should still be talking about the parting of the Red Sea. Uh, every day they're going out. To, they haven't gotten tired of manna yet. Uh, there, there's still an excitement about all of that. Uh, look in verse number 16. 
The Bible said, now they, they've come to this place called Mount Sinai. Uh, and it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. So they are assembled uh, around my, Mount Sinai. They have fences actually built around the base of the mountain so that nobody can go up because that mountain is about to become a holy place. And the, the, the Lord descends onto the top of that and there's thunderings, lightnings, there's a, there's a thick cloud uh, and all of that. They hear the sound of a trumpet blowing and everybody's down there. All these people are looking up at this mountain and um, if you would, it, it may have, the, rep, it may have uh, the similarities to a volcanic eruption going on. It is that dramatic and that powerful, but what it is is the presence of the Lord. Verse 17, Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the nether part of the mount. And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. When the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mount, and the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount, and Moses went up. So everybody else is standing at the bottom of the mountain. They've heard the voice of God uh, calling out to Moses saying, come up here. And they've watched Moses uh, ascend up onto Mount Sinai. And he's actually going into the, those thick clouds where, where all of this is going on. God is putting on an awesome display of his power. Um, he is establishing his might. He is establishing his authority in the eyes of these people. Remember, they've been redeemed out of bondage in Egypt, but at this point they know very little about their God. So God is giving them a huge introduction to who he is. I look at chapter number 20. Ch chapter number 20. Moses went up uh, onto the mountain while he was there. Uh, the, the Lord spake the uh, Ten Commandments starting in uh, verse number 2 uh, um, and, and going down through uh, verse number 17. But I want us to pick it up at verse 18. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. They were terrified, and, and rightly so. They were standing in the, the, the awesome presence of God, and they just started backing up. There were, there were no curiosity seekers there saying, hey, I'm going to slip through the fences and go up there and get a peek. Um, the fear of God was falling on them. By the way, the fear of God is not a bad thing. It is a good thing. The Bible says that it is the beginning of wisdom, and it is the beginning of knowledge. Um, so these people are experiencing that. They said unto Moses, speak thou with us and we will hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. Um, they are, they're just utterly terrified of the Lord. And uh, so they said, you go up there and, and you, you let God talk to you and you come down and tell us what he said. Don't, don't make us go up there lest we die. So the, these people have this mentality. It was the right one. Um, uh, verse number 21 and the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. And the Lord said unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, Ye have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. Ye shall not make with me gods of silver, neither shall ye make unto you gods of gold. An altar of earth thou shalt make unto me, and shalt sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings, and thy peace offerings, thy sheep, and thine oxen, in all the places where I record my name, I will come unto thee, and I will bless thee. Now, God's given some specific instructions, and, and I, I am really going somewhere with all this. Would you notice God said in verse 23, uh, ye shall not make with me gods of silver, neither shall ye make unto you gods of gold. No idols, silver or gold. You'll not have gods that replace me, and you'll not have gods that you add to me. You'll not have any of those things. Then he tells them, you'll build an altar of earth. And he said, on that, you're going to offer burnt offerings. A burnt offering was a sacrifice uh, that was for, it was, it was a sin offering, if you will. Uh, they burnt that, confessing their, their sins over the animal and so, so forth. So that's a burnt offering. A peace offering was a fellowship offering. 
When they brought a peace offering in, the priest got part of it, uh, but the people got the rest and they shared it together. And uh, it was a picture of having fellowship with God and it was, it was also symbolized the fellowship there are to be among God's people. All these things I'm just pointing about, uh, don't, don't make gods with him, don't, don't uh, make gods in place of him, and then the burnt offerings and the peace offerings. Um, so they, they are, are learning about their God, chapter 24. And we're all working up to the most unusual name of God, in my opinion, in the Bible. How many think you know what it is? Okay, I've got you all mystified or asleep. One of the two. Uh, Exodus chapter 24. Um, it's still Mount Sinai. This is still the same event going on. Uh, and he, that's the Lord, said unto Moses, Come up unto the Lord, thou and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, those are the sons of Aaron, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and worship ye afar off. And Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come nigh, neither shall the people go up with him. Now, originally, God just called Moses uh, to go up in the mountain, and the Lord talked with him. And Moses came back down and met with the people. Now the Lord calls again, said, Moses, I want you to come bring your brother Aaron. Aaron is going to become the first high priest of Israel before the book of Exodus is done. Bring Aaron's two sons, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel. Um, in ancient times, they had great respect uh, for uh, old age, if you will, the wisdom that goes along with that. It was a much, uh, very much a patriarchal society. He said, bring 70. The elders were the leaders, the representatives of each of the tribes. So now it's not just Moses going up on the mount. Uh, there's actually uh, 74 people uh, going up there all together now. But uh, those, uh, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and the 70 elders, they're only allowed to come so far. Moses can come all the way, but they, can, they have to worship God afar off. And this is all happening in the sight of all of the Israelites. They're all down there on the plain, uh, spread out by the mountain, watching this whole thing uh, unfold before them. Uh, look, if you would, please. Um, oh, verse number 12 of uh, chapter 24 again. The Lord said unto Moses, um, I'll tell you what, let's go back to verse 9. Then went up Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone, and as it were, the body of heaven in his clearness. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand. Also, they saw God and did eat and drink. What an awesome experience. Do you ever hope that we get to heaven and God will have DVDs of all these great, great moments of the Bible? How many, how many are thinking that? This is one that I would like to see. Uh, I'd like to see the Red Sea. I'd like to see the look on Haman's face when he finds out that Esther's a Jew. Um, I, that, I, just that one moment captured for all eternity would be great. Um, this is, this is, by the way, this is all important, what we're talking about here. These people are experiencing God in a miraculous, dynamic way. They know that their God is real. In Egypt, they were used to multitudes of gods. Uh, Egypt had about 300 to 360 uh, gods. They had family gods, household gods, and so forth. Um, and the Hebrews that were there were used to seeing all the temples and the idols and the shrines to those things. Uh, but those gods didn't do anything. You went to their temple and you might burn incense before them. They'd sacrifice before them. They'd dance around them and all that kind of stuff. But the stone statue just sat there. This is the living God. This is the living God who's showing them his power. They're hearing his voice. Now 70 of the leaders plus Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu are also seeing it. So nobody is just going to take Moses' word for what's going on up in that mountain. There are plenty of eyewitnesses corroborating uh, all of this. Uh, look, if you would, please, uh, in uh, verse 12, And the Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me in the mount and be there, and I will give thee tables of stone and the law and commandments which I have written that thou mayest teach them. The first written word of God uh, in human history. And Moses went up, and his minister Joshua, and Moses went up into the mount of God. And he said unto the elders, Tarry ye here for us until we come again unto you. And behold, Aaron and her are with you. 
If any man have any matters to do, let him come unto them. And Moses went up into the mount, and a cloud covered the mount. Now, we're, we're getting a, a, a lot of little details here that right now uh, you're just getting pieces, and you don't see how the, these, this puzzle is going to fit together. Uh, he talked about, you'll have no gods with me, and you'll have no gods in place of me. You offer burnt offerings, you offer peace offerings. They're seeing God. All of the people are seeing that mountain quake. They're hearing the sound of the trumpet. They've heard the voice of God. Uh, now Moses has taken 73 others with him up there, and they see God. They don't die. God spares them that, uh, and, and they're, they're seeing the living God. Moses goes up with, uh, and, and, and God says, I'm going to give you the tables uh, that I have written the law and the commandments. And then he said, and uh, Moses turned around and said, Aaron and another man by the name of Hur, H-U-R, Aaron and Hur, they're going to be in charge while I'm up there. Okay? How many are with me so far? You say, what's the point of this? You'll see it uh, in just a little bit. Let's go to uh, Exodus chapter 32. It's been 40 days since Moses went up alone. Aaron... Nadab, Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel, they've come down off the mountain, and undoubtedly, they have told everybody what they saw. Everybody's marveling at all of this, but 40 days have gone by. 40 days. Um, that's a that's, uh, little over a month has gone by. Verse 1 of chapter 32. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount... The people gathered themselves together unto whom? Aaron. Why? Why did they go to Aaron? Because Moses put him in charge, right? Okay, so they come to Aaron and they say, Up, make us what? Make us gods. Does that, does that not strike somebody here odd? That they have seen the living God, they've seen his power, they're eating his bread every morning. It's miraculous food from heaven. Um, they watched the, the parting of the Red Sea. They saw all of those plagues that befell uh, the Egyptians uh, as God was getting ready to, to deliver Israel from all that. They experienced the night of the Passover. And uh, so they're at that mount. Uh, it's quaking. Uh, the presence of God is there. And, and here they come to Aaron, the man that was left in charge, and said, up, make us gods. Do you realize how quickly they've walked away from God? By the way, the mountain is still smoking. The mountain is still there. The cloud is still there. It's not like that, you know, they're, they're a thousand miles away. And, and, and all. I mean, they're still sitting in the presence of that mountain. But it's been 40 days since they saw Moses. So they get impatient. And uh, so they, they, they make some decisions. They say to Aaron, uh, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses... Do you, do you understand every, everything I read on this? Um, uh, all of the Jewish rabbis and commentators, they see this, that they're actually being very sarcastic about Moses. For as for this man, Moses, as if, you know, who knows where this guy is? Who knows what this guy's all about? He just shows up one day, and, all the, and, and now we don't know where he's at. Uh, it, it was actually very much a put-down rather than showing respect to the guy God used to bring them out of bondage after all of those years. Um, for as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we what not what has become of him. W-O-T means we know not uh, what has become of him. So uh, they've lost their patience. And uh, by the way, I want you to understand, uh, they don't want to go back to the land of Egypt. They want to go to the promised land. Okay? That's where, that, that's God's promise to them. From Abraham to Isaac to Jacob and now to them. That's what their journey's all about, is going to the promised land, the land that flows with milk and honey. That's what God's been telling them ever since Moses showed up on the scene. So they still want to go to the promised land. This is all very important. Don't, don't let me lose you just yet. Um, they all want to go to the promised land, and, and they, want, they want God in their life. But they're going to have God on their own terms. 
They, they want it their way. They don't want to wait. I mean, he's right there in front of him, but they don't want to wait to see what that God's got to say. They just want to go ahead on their own. Now, somebody might be tempted to argue, and I, I doubt if anybody would. Well, at least they had right motives. They had right intentions. They wanted to go to the promised land. Uh, good intentions are fine, uh, but they're not good enough. The Lord said we're supposed to worship him not only in sincerity, but also in what? In truth. So these people are setting themselves up for disaster. They came to Aaron, who was appointed by God to lead, said, up, make us gods. And Aaron said unto them, break off the golden earrings, which are in the ears of your wives and of your sons and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. Now, this is very important here. Um, Earrings, when they wore them in those days, were not a sign of beauty. I, I, I'm still old school enough. I don't think earrings on guys is a sign of beauty today. Uh, but that's not what it was for. An earring was a sign of slavery. That, that's, that's what it was. That was a sign of slavery. Uh, that entire multitude, they were slaves. So they come up and say, up, oh, make us gods. Did you recall that God told them not to have any gods of silver with him and not to make unto them any gods of gold. How many remember we, we kind of stressed that? And all of a sudden, they're ignoring the word of God. It's not written down, but they heard it. They're ignoring the word of God and they're gonna worship on their own. So they come to Aaron. What should Aaron have done when they came and said, we don't know where Moses went, we want to go to the promised land, make us gods um, to get us on our journey. What should Aaron have done? Anybody? Yeah, he should have said no. He, he should have said, what on earth are you talking about? What more God do you want than that? I, I mean, what more proof do you have? That's, that's God. Show me what happened. To, uh, re, let me remind you what happened to the gods of Egypt and, and all of that. That's what Aaron should have done but Aaron did not. Aaron said, take those earrings and you've got, you got uh, some scholars think uh, at least two, two and a half million uh, people there. Even the children had, had these golden earrings in there, said, break those things off and then they're gonna melt it down and they're gonna end up making a golden calf. I, I was thinking about this, Brother Wilson, as I uh, think about what they were doing. Um, those earrings were a symbol of their bondage. They were saying, we're gonna be free. We have liberty. We're free. And they were going to use that to worship God in the way that they saw fit. Um, all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears, brought them unto Aaron, and he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Um, absolutely Amazing that this is going on. So they are, in the, they are, this is all happening in the presence of Mount Sinai that's smoking and quaking and trembling and all of those things. So Aaron makes them a golden calf. Um, uh, the calf was a god that the Egyptians worshipped. Uh, it was a god called Ha'ap. It's H-A-A-P, but it's actually two separate syllables. And he was the, the god of domesticated animals. And uh, the, the Israelites were shepherds and they had flocks and they had herds and stuff with them. And so they made a golden calf, uh, something that they would have learned down in Egypt. They're letting Egypt tell them how to worship God. We are not supposed to let the world tell us how to worship God. We're not supposed to take our little surveys out and ask the unsaved world, well, what would you like in church? What don't you like about church? And, and okay, well we'll, well, we'll make a church that, that you like. No, we're supposed to take the only survey we need, and it's, uh, the correct answer is ding, 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 the Bible. We're just supposed to let the Bible tell us what we're supposed to do. So they're, they're borrowing from Egypt, and uh, they, they saw, these be thy gods, O Israel. Remember, God said, no gods of silver with thee, no gods of gold, uh, 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 and so forth. And now they've got that. Um, verse number for the end, these be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. You, you got to picture this. Here's a quaking mountain. Moses, the man of God, has been up there for 40 days. 73 people in that crowd have been there, including Aaron, 
who is letting himself be manipulated uh, by the masses. They got the living God right there. And if that's not enough, all they got to do is turn around and look right above the camp where all these thousands of tents are pitched, where the people sleep at night. And there's that pillar of fire and that pillar of cloud. That morning, they went out and gathered up baskets full of manna, miraculous food from heaven. So these people are living in the presence of a living God, and they look at this golden calf. They, they knew it came from their earrings. They watched Aaron uh, make it and all that, and they say, these are the gods that brought you out of Egypt. Does that make any sense at all? That God didn't do anything. That God can't take itself anywhere. They would have to carry it around uh, and so forth. And so they, they've got everything backwards. And uh, uh, understand this. They've determined to worship God. They want to receive his blessing. But they want everything on their terms. Brother Wilson, it's interesting to me as I look through that. When they came to Aaron, they did not say, you know, this guy Moses that brought us out of land. Of Egypt, we have no idea what happened to him. Make us a new leader. Give, give us somebody else to lead us. They didn't ask for a new leader. What did they ask for? What did they ask for? They asked for new gods. They, and it's only, it's only three, well now it's, it's a little over four months since they came out of Egypt and all this is going on. Uh, look if you would please to, um, uh, let's see, verse number five. When Aaron saw it, now he built the calf. The it there, I th think, is not just talking about the golden calf. He's talking about their reaction to it. That's our God. That's the God that brought us out. Aaron now tries to put a positive spin on idolatry. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, just like God said back in, in uh, chapter, uh, I believe it was 21. Uh, he builds an altar and made a proclamation, said, tomorrow is a feast to what? The Lord. Did you notice? Lord is in all caps. That's, that's the Hebrew name Jehovah. Okay? So they've got a golden calf, just like they worship down in Egypt. They've ascribed to this golden calf attributes of deity that this is God. This, this golden calf brought us out of Egypt. It didn't do anything. When the golden calf came out of Egypt, it was in the form of earrings on their ears. It had nothing to do with it. That God brought them out of Egypt. So Aaron sees all of this going on. He says, I tell you what, uh, maybe the idol is not such a good thing, but tomorrow we're just going to go along this, and tomorrow's going to be a feast to Jehovah. So we're going we're gonna to use an Egyptian idol, and, and all of that, but we're going we're gonna to call it Jehovah worship. They rose up early in the morrow and offered what? Burnt offerings, just like God said, and brought peace offerings, just like God had said. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. It's an interesting statement. Uh, how many go to family reunions? I haven't been to one in years. Mine's... Mine kind of scares me just a little bit. Um, and uh, I, on, on my side of the family, I have a cousin who's an FBI agent, and I also have cousins that the FBI agents hunt down. So uh, we, we've kind of got the best of both worlds going on. But I remember as a little kid, uh, the best part of the family reunion was all the games afterwards. And when you think, well, the people sat down uh, to eat and to drink and rose up to play all, uh, they were having sack races and three-legged, that's not what it means. Uh, what was going on, if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, these, these people uh, just began a drunken party. I mean, drunken party, complete with music, complete with music. This is going on. We'll, we'll, come, we'll back up, but let's, let's skip ahead just for a moment. Um, and uh, please look at verse 7. I guess we're not, we're not uh, going ahead at all. Lord said unto Moses, Moses up on the mount. He has no idea what his brother just did and what, what the people are doing. The Lord said unto Moses, go get thee down for thy people. Do you realize God's not claiming them? Thy people. Instead of my people, he said, thy people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. Here, here's what I want you to understand. We, we smile a little bit at this, but do you realize the living God watches them fashion their own religion and try to say it's all God, it's all about Jehovah, 
and God's distancing himself from them, he will not claim, he doesn't even want to claim them, and he's, he's definitely not claiming their religion. He said they have corrupted themselves. He goes on to say they have turned aside, you might want to circle this, they have turned aside quickly. Backsliding happens a whole lot faster than you could ever imagine. All it takes is you, go, you hang around a gossip or a critic and they'll have you out of church faster than you thought was possible. You just look at a dirty image and you'll be hooked faster than you ever dreamed of. They turned aside quickly. It's been four months since the Red Sea. And they're down here. The Bible says in, in other places they were naked. They were, they were having a wild wild party around this golden calf. He said, uh, they've turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. Now, they didn't know everything about worship yet, but they knew no God, gods of silver with God, no gods of gold unto them. They, they were told all of that. And they've already violated all of this, what they knew. Uh, they've sacrificed thereunto and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them, that I may consume them. God's about to burn them up. God's about to rain on their parade. We got we to gotta come to the understanding with God that what God sent, said in his word, he meant he meant it. He, he, he holds us to it. He does not take his word nearly as lightly as we do. And we can go out with all of our substitutes for the word of God, all of our substitutes for, for how we're supposed to serve God, how we're supposed to live, how we're supposed to behave, and all of that. And, and we can say, well, it's, I, I'm, it's all, I love God, and it's all about that. God doesn't accept our substitutes. He said, I gave, you, I gave you my commandments. That's how it's supposed to be. I gave you my word. You're supposed to do it my way. I'm not accepting your substitute. God is so angry at these people who so quickly have gone out of the way that he's ready to destroy them. Verse 11, Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou has brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand. Moses just turns to the response to that. I'm not claiming these people either. Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, for mischief did he bring them out, to slay them in the mountains, to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from this fierce wrath and, and repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and said us unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord repented of the evil. God wasn't about to sin. It was just going to be a very negative thing God was going to do to them, which he thought to do unto his people. Uh, notice Moses didn't beseech the Lord and said, God, you know really deep down inside they're really good people. They really mean well. He, he didn't do that. Uh, they'd corrupted themselves. They, they had done wrong. Uh, God was right on that. He said, he said, God, do it for your namesake. If you destroy these people now, the Egyptians are going to think that you're a bad God and that following you is a bad thing. Um, if you can't bless them because of what they're doing, remember what you promised to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. Bless these people, forgive them, at least for Abraham's sake. Uh, he's interceding. If it wasn't for Moses... The man of God, these people might have died right at that moment. Uh, the Lord repented. Verse 15, Moses turned, went down from the mount, and the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides, on the, uh, on the one side and on the other were they written. And the tables were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God, graven upon the tables. Verse 17, when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto, unto Moses, there is a noise of what? war in the camp. It sounded like a riot going on down in that camp. You got to understand, two million people, and, and they're all in this drunken party and, and all of that. They're still up on the mountain, and they think that there's war going on. They're, they're screaming. There's, there's all this uh, noise. Notice Moses' response. In verse 18, he said, it is not the voice of them that shout for the mastery, 
Neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of, noise of them that sing do I hear. Their music sounded like the noise of war. Anybody ever heard any music like that? Um, God's a God of music. We don't have time to go into it tonight. Did you know that Lucifer was the angel of music according to the word of God? The book of Ezekiel, he was the angel of music. Um, there is godly music and there's ungodly music, and that's a subject for another time. But I'm going to tell you, they weren't singing Amazing Grace around the golden calf. If, 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 they were, if they were worshiping Egypt's gods, I'll guarantee you they were playing Egypt's music. Um, and so all of this is in the, it is, while, while Mount Sinai is right there, smoking, quaking, and trembling, you said, Pastor, you're going to make a point here? Sooner or later, I will. Now I want you to turn, please, to, um, oh, let's see, Exodus 34. 3,000 people died that day immediately when Moses came down. There were 3,000 died. Then the Bible says the Lord sent a plague among the people. doesn't say at that time how many died, just that the people were plagued. Um, I had you go to 34. Let, let me go back to 33. I apologize. The Lord said unto Moses in verse 1, Depart and go up hence, thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt, unto the land which I swear unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying unto thy seed will I give it. And I will send an angel before thee, and I will drive out the Canaanite, and the Amorite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. It seems like God's forgiven them. It, it seems like it's all done with. And now they're just going to, Move on. God says, take the people. He once again says, the people that you brought out of the land of Egypt, and you go ahead and you take them to Canaan. He said, and not only that, he said, I'll, I'll send my angel before you, and I'll drive out all the inhabitants of the land. There were seven heathen nations there. I'll drive them out. It's a land that flows with milk and honey, and they can go. But then God made this pronouncement. He said uh, in verse 3, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in the midst of thee. God said, you can go have the land, but I'm not going with you. Now think about this. They were in the presence of God, but they wanted a golden calf. Well, the golden calf's gone. Moses ground it up, uh, mixed it with water, made him drink it. Had to be a pretty nasty thing. I, I don't like drinks that have chunks in them. It just reminds me of backwash, and I can't even stand the thought of that. Um, 3,000 people have died. They've had 3,000 funerals. There's been a plague that swept through the land, and whether people died or just got horribly ill, uh, it's, it's been a bad time. They had the living God. They experienced the living God, but they wanted, a, they wanted a golden calf. They wanted God on their terms. Uh, golden calf is gone. Now God says, go ahead. You can go to your promised land. That's what you wanted the calf to do. That was your God that brought you out of Egypt. You just said he's the one that will take us to the promised land. Go ahead. God said, I'll give it to you. I'll give you your land, but I'm not going. Notice the people's response to this. Verse number four. And when the people heard these, what? Evil tidings. All these people down here that have seen the, the wrath of God they saw it as an evil tiding that they were going to get the promised land, but not God. See, we live in a day and age where we want the promised land, but we really don't want God. God has too many restrictions on us. God, God has too many thou shalts and thou shalt nots. God expects us to be holy. God expects us to go to church. God expects us to, to look like Christians and talk like Christians and act like Christians. But we want, the, we want all the blessings of God. That, that's why some of these TV preachers can get away with what they do. They, they, uh, they will not preach against sin. They will not mention the word hell. Um, some of them don't even mention the name Jesus. It's all about prosperity. Uh, it, it's all about realizing your potential. It's all about being fulfilled. Um, and there's, there's no Bible. Um, but see, what, what, what do people want? They want the promised land without God. That's what God said, okay, that's what you wanted. Go get your promised land, but I'm not going to go. And the people saw that as an evil tiding. And the Bible says, and they mourned. They mourned. They began to grieve. They're, they're at a place now where they're starting to take heed to this God on the mountain. 
It's all becoming very, very real to them. In this chapter, Moses says in verse number 18, he says to the Lord, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Uh, he's, he's up talking with the Lord. He said, I, I want to see your glory. And uh, we go to chapter 34 and verse number five, Moses is back up on the mountain again. He's got two more tables of stone. Uh, taking up with him and the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord the Lord God merciful merciful and gracious long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth uh, I don't know how many of you are, are doing the renewed mind journal last Sunday uh, it seemed like about 70 75 percent of our church was, was doing at least some of it in my praise column almost every day uh, I thank God uh, for his mercy and for his grace and for being long-suffering. Everything that God declared himself to be uh, in verse number six. So Moses is, is, is hearing all of this and, and so forth. Now look at verse number 10, the Lord speaking. He's speaking to Moses. He said, behold, I make a covenant. Before all thy people I will do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth nor in any nation. And all the people among which thou art shall see the work of the Lord, for it is a terrible thing that I will do with thee. Observe thou that which I command thee this day. Behold, I drive out before thee the Amorite and the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land whither thou goest, lest it be a snare, lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. But ye shall destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their groves. For thou shalt worship no other God. For the Lord, whose name is what? Jealous, is a jealous God. One of the names of God is Jehovah. One of the names of God is Elohim. One of the names of God is Adonai. One of the names of God uh, is, is uh, Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Nissi, uh, Je Jeloma, uh, Jehovah uh, Rohi, and so forth. Uh, those are all names for God. There's another name for God. Notice the word jealous starts with a capital J. God said, my name is Jealous. Isn't that kind of weird? I, I remember as a young Christian reading that thinking, wait, jealousy is a bad thing, isn't it? Um, God said, y you, you don't mess with the heathen. Uh, he said, because once you start running with the heathen, you'll start worshiping like the heathen worship. You'll start following after their gods and you'll start following their ways. He said, and there's no other God but me. He said, you'll worship me, he said, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. Look at a couple verses with me where we see this, uh, this uh, word used again, Nahum chapter one. Jonah, Micah, Nahum. How many have found the book of index and you're looking up Nahum now? <clears throat> Nahum chapter one. The burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkishite. God is jealous and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. So Nahum's first sermon recorded starts with the words, God is jealous. Now, jealous means that we want something that someone else has. We, we want their possessions. We want their looks. We want their talent. Uh, we want their car. We want their popularity. And we're, we're jealous of them. Now, remember, God's a holy God. Jealousy for us is always a bad thing. We, we can't handle that. Uh, it, it, it's a bad thing. That's why the Bible says, thou shalt not covet. When it says that God is jealous, what it means is that, that God takes his, his property very personally. It's his. Nobody messes with God's stuff. It's important to him. He loves it. And, uh, and, and uh, what, uh, we are his possession. Israel was his chosen people. We are now his chosen people. We belong to God. We are a royal priesthood. First Peter chapter uh, 2 tells us. And so God is jealous over us. Uh, when we start uh, drifting away from God and we're, we're more uh, enamored with the unsaved world out there and all the sin that's going on out there, God gets very jealous of that because the unsaved world does not deserve our attention. It does not deserve our affection. The unsaved world can't get us to heaven. 
That's why Christ had to come and die on the cross for us. The unsaved world can't give us peace. The unsaved world can't answer our prayers. The unsaved world will, uh, can never say, we will never leave you nor forsake you. Just ask the prodigal son about that. He had a lot of friends till the money ran out, and then he had no friends at all. Um, God says, I created you. I died for you. I, I preserve you. I take care of you. I look out for you. And uh, when you turn your affections and your attention to, to anything besides me, God says, I'm a jealous God. I'm jealous because you belong to me. You don't belong to them. The word jealousy to us just doesn't, it doesn't sound like it ought to work. Matthew Henry uh, when when uh, I looked up what he had to say about Exodus chapter 34, uh, when God calls his name jealous, he said, those cannot worship God aright who do not worship him alone. Did you get that? Those cannot worship God aright who do not worship him alone. I can't, Jesus put it this way, no man can serve two masters. For he will love the one and hate the other or he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and master. It's an impossibility. You cannot do it. Um, God says, I'm a jealous God. A um, couple of things that I, I jotted down for myself. Uh, this is not sinful for God to say this of himself because God is entitled to our full affection and our commitment. God's entitled to it. Turn back to Revelation chapter four, and I'm about to wind this down. Revelation chapter 4, verse number 11 says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. God's entitled to all of our praise and all of our honor and all of our glory and all of our blessing. He's entitled to it. He made us, he redeemed us. Look at chapter five of Revelation. Verse number uh, 11, I beheld and heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beast and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and under the lamb forever and ever. God is entitled to our full affection and our, our attention. And when we give it to anybody else, he gets jealous of that. Not sinfully so because he's entitled to it. Uh, turn to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. In the book of 1 John, John challenges us about what, what it really means to love the Lord. He said, if you, if you say that you know him, you ought to walk as he commanded. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. John repeats that theme over and over and over again in this little epistle of 1 John. That, it, that if, if you really love God, you'll love one another. And if you don't love each other, you're lying. You don't love God. John, John minces no words. He uses the word liar a lot and just, just nails us between the eyes because he's, he's pointing us, we're supposed to love God and that love for God ought to be, be demonstrated through everything that we do, especially by how we treat one another. But look, with all that said, at verse 21 of chapter 5, the last verse in this little letter, he says, little children, keep yourselves from what? Idols. Anybody see any idols in here? Yeah, no Buddhas in here. No statues of saints or anything like that. We don't have any idols in here. So I guess we don't have to worry about that verse, do we? Oh, there's lots of idols. Sometimes uh, your house is your idol. Everything's all about that house. Uh, I've seen young people get their first car and that car becomes their idol. Everything in their life revolves around that car. They'll get a job that'll get them out of church because they, they got this car and they want to keep it up and they want to they they do all kinds of stuff to it. Uh, I've seen cars cause young men to fall away from God. Car's not a bad thing, is it? But when you, when you take the, your attention and affection and, and place importance on that car over God, it's become an idol. God's a jealous God. God not only is entitled to our full affection and commitment, God expects it. 
Uh, the first commandment with promise that was given according to Jesus in Matthew chapter 22. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. Not with part of it, not with some of it, not with most of it. He said with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your might. He said this is the first and the great commandment. God expects it. He's entitled to it. And he exerts his wrath on those who, who uh, mess with his people. The jealousy of God is not just God, God's entitled to my praise and God's entitled to my love and affection and God expects it from me, but God is also jealous over me. You, you mess with me, you mess with God. Someone messes with you, child of God, they're messing with God. Remember when Saul of Tarsus was, Tarsus was breathing out threatening and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord? He's going down to Damascus and he had his encounter with Jesus. And Jesus uh, knocked him off his horse about noonday, and he said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Who was Saul persecuting? He was persecuting the Christians. He was persecuting the church. Jesus said, you persecute my church, you persecute me. Isn't it good to know that God feels that way about us? By the way, that's how we ought to feel about God. It ought to bother us when somebody uses our God's name as a cuss word. It ought to just bother us. I'll even hear saved people sometimes use the phrase, oh my G-O-D. Um, and, and they're not praying. Like, like the psalmist said, oh my God, I will trust in thee. And I believe it's Psalm 25. They're not praying. They're just, you know, flippantly putting it out. That's taking the Lord's name in vain. Don't do that. We ought to be jealous of that name. We ought to, we ought to guard the name of God. We, we ought to get upset when people mock our God. Because God gets upset when people mock his children. Um, look, if you would, please, to Zechariah chapter 2. This would be our last verse. Zechariah chapter 2. Now God here is speaking about his Old Testament church. If you find Matthew, go backwards. Matthew, then Malachi, then Zechariah. <clears throat> Zechariah chapter 2 and verse 8. God speaks to his people, and he says, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, after the glory hath he sent me unto the nations which spoiled you, for he that toucheth you toucheth the apple of his eye. Child of God, that's how God feels about you. And he's jealous over you. And he, he's not going to tolerate anybody doing you wrong. He's going to deal with that because you belong to him. So God says, I, I took you that, through that whole scenario, starting in Exodus 19 through Exodus 34. Just realize this. Let's, let's imagine the, that we're God up on the mountain. We just redeemed those people from 400 years of slavery. They came out of Egypt wealthy because the Egyptians just cast jewels of gold and all kinds of stuff on them. Um, the, they walked through the water uh, of the Red Sea on dry land. I, I've been feeding them every single day for four plus months. I've given them water. I've got the pillar of cloud. I've done miracle after miracle after miracle. And so I'm up there. And these are the people I've done all that for. And just like that, quickly, they turn their back on me and saying, we want the promised land, but let's make us our own gods. And we'll worship God just like the Egyptians do. And here's that God that just did everything for them watching them dancing naked around a golden calf that did nothing for them. And they aroused the wrath of that God, and they learned on that day a new name for God. He said, my name is Jealous. I deserve better than that from my people. How many follow that? We serve an awesome God. We do. What a privilege. He's worthy of our praise. He's worthy of our devotion. He's worthy of our obedience. And let's never forget that. We need to stop here at this time. Is there anyone who did not receive a prayer list when you came in tonight? Anybody who did not receive one? Please write the name uh, down, uh, Colette. And, and the last name is T-R-E-P-A-N-I-E-R. -E -E That's Micheline's uh, aunt. And uh, so uh, please be praying for her, uh, if you would, please. Um, I, while you got your prayer list, I would like you to turn your Bibles to the book of Proverbs chapter 3. So what's this? It's Bible study part 2. Proverbs chapter 3. Just want to look at something very familiar and then throw out a, a very, very big prayer request for you. 
The Bible says in verse number five, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. There's a path God wants us to follow in our lives. How many understand that? Um, David understood that. That's why he said, order my steps according to thy words. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delighteth in his way. Teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes. And David prayed that uh, over and, and over again. Um, there's a way that we think is right, but there's, there's a way that God wants us to live. Um, and that, that path takes us on a journey. Uh, we're all here tonight because of the journey God has for us. Um, I, I uh, got saved in Pennsylvania, got called to preach, went to college in Indiana. Uh, I was a youth pastor in New York. Then God called me to Pennsylvania. Then God called me here. That's all. I'm just following God's path for my life. How many understand? That's what, what we're talking about in Proverbs chapter number three. We don't always understand that path. Uh, we sometimes can't say that we even like uh, everything about the path. But one thing we learned is God's way is always right. God's way is is always best. And uh, our church is at one of those uh, points in time where um, God's gonna God's doing something. He's done something, uh, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna trust have to trust the Lord on that. Uh, I came to pastor here 18 years ago, and. Um, uh, we had a school staff and so forth. I had a secretary, but we had no pastoral staff. And uh, I knew we needed a youth pastor right away. And uh, the Lord directed us to uh, Pastor Wilson. And uh, he was getting married to Heather. And they came up at Christmas time, my first year here. And, and Brian and I met. And um, my wife asked me later, she said, um, she said, what'd you think of him? I said, if I were to write out a list of everything I'm looking for in a youth pastor, Brian Wilson's the guy. And 17 years later, he has certainly uh, uh, proved that uh, in every single way. And uh, God brought the Wilsons here, but uh, God is moving the Wilsons away from us. Uh, Brother Wilson has accepted the pastorate of a church in uh, Tremont. Is that right? Trenton, Trenton, Missouri. And uh, and he has uh, been candidating and uh, been praying about this for the last several weeks. And I've known for a couple years that uh, he was probably getting ready to step out and God was going to use him to pastor a church. And uh, so he came and told me yesterday afternoon uh, that uh, they had called him and he uh, has accepted that call. Uh, The Wilsons are going to stick around here uh, until September the 25th will be their their last Sunday with us. Uh, They're going to actually fly out to Missouri tomorrow. They've got to look into some housing. They've got to sell their home here. Uh, they've got a lot to do over the course of the next seven or eight weeks. And, uh, um, you know, I, I, I've known it was probably going to happen. And part of me was praying, Lord, can you let it just wait for another year? And I knew I, another year I'd be saying, Lord, how about another year? Uh, but I know that he's doing the will of God for his life. And uh, I remember telling you that we were going to have a youth pastor and Brian was coming and never Never gave thought that I would have to stand up one night and say, uh, God's called them away from us. Um, we love the Wilsons. Uh, they've been a godsend to our church, haven't they? Um, I was just telling somebody the other night, when I got sick, if it wasn't for Brother Wilson, I don't know what we'd have done around here. He, God just used him to keep the church going forward. And uh, how many have had kids in his youth group? Mine went, uh, two of them went all the way through it. Tim went halfway through because he was in... Uh, high school when we moved here, but uh, we owe debt of gratitude. We'll do some things for them before they leave, but we need to pray for them, okay? New responsibility is on his shoulder, uh, and uh, Heather's going to be pastor's wife. This will be the first year in like 900 years you haven't taught, and uh, so it's going to be different. Uh, be praying here for the ministry. Everything's, everything's going forward uh, as planned. Uh, the school we're, is uh, going uh, forward well, and we've, we've got things in place, and we're working on everything to make sure that we have a great school year, uh, but we need a lot of prayer, and uh, 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 he's going to preach for us the last Sunday night that he's here, and I'll let him tell his story and share his testimony. Um, take some time over these next weeks to love on them, take them out to dinner or whatever, or just talk with them. I'm sure you've got a billion questions, and uh, don't ask me, just ask him. Uh, I'm glad that this man and I are parting on the best of terms because I don't want him to go, um, but I understand him going. And uh, 
he's, he's been a godsend. And so uh, I've been kind of, that's been in the back of my mind all day that I had to make that announcement tonight. So um, that's, that's what I want you to pray about. He's trusting the Lord. He's prayed and he sought the Lord to get a, a piece about that. And he's letting God direct his path. And uh, so that's God's plan and will for his life. And uh, they said that we can all come out to uh, Trenton, Missouri and uh, vacation with them. They'll put us all up at one time and uh, take care of us. And uh, what's the name of your church, Brother Wilson? Liberty Baptist Church uh, in Trenton, Missouri. So you start praying for them. They're going to have to wait two months for the new pastor. Um, and uh, so uh, let's just go to the Lord in prayer right now. Father, we thank you for loving us. Or the longer I've been saved, the more I've noticed that you just bring people into our lives. Sometimes they stay for just a, a short time and sometimes they stay for years. But they, they influence us. They help us on our journey. They teach us something. They pray with us. They encourage us. They make a difference in our lives. Lord, I thank you for Brian and Heather Wilson Lord, that you brought them to our church for such a time as this. When we had no teen Sunday school class, we had no youth department, you sent a, a man with a burden for youth who built a great youth group, taught them how to go soul winning, established the powerhouse rally and then the youth conference in the summer. And Lord, uh, teens are serving God all over, all over this church and all over this country that were trained in his youth group. Heather has educated 17 years worth of young people and given them the most solid foundation in English and grammar and literature that they could ever hope to get. She has been a faithful youth pastor's wife. She's been there for the activities and the camps and the trips and she's prayed with our girls and loved them and carried that burden. And Lord, in our hearts, we're, we're really sad to see them go. Lord, you know that I've been praying for your will to be done, but I've also been asking you, please, Lord, let your will be that they get to stay. But Lord, we understand that they need to follow you, and there's a church that has been without a pastor for a while and needs them. There's a town that needs to be reached. You've already given Brian a burden. You've already given him a vision for that town. Lord, I pray that you will bless them. They, they need to sell their condo. Would you... Lord, would you sell that right away so that they're not leaving and sitting with a mortgage and utilities and all the things they have here in Connecticut and trying to pay for rent and everything in Missouri. Lord, would you just take care of that and sell it in record time? Record time. May they get a good price for it. Lord, would you help them as they finish up everything here? And uh, Lord, help them tomorrow as they fly out and they seek where they're going to live and start getting the lay of the land and give them great wisdom and knit their hearts with their new church family. And may Brian and Heather always know that this church family will never forget them and never stop loving them. Thank you, Lord, that we've got seven or eight weeks to just love on the Wilsons, to just fellowship with them, to reminisce with them. Lord, bless our church. Bless our church. I saw the tears start to flow almost immediately when I said that God had called Brian away. And Lord, a lot of people, we, our hearts are sad tonight and they haven't even gone yet. We're just sad. But when you love people, sadness is sometimes a part of it. Lord, would you just help us here? For every place that the Wilsons have served, somebody needs to arise and fill that role. And it's your church, it's your school, it's your youth group. You've already provided a young youth pastor that Brian got to train. And, and Rob has stepped forward and is taking the youth group forward and doing a fine job and following in those footsteps that Brian put before him. So Lord, help us as a church to move forward. Help Brian and Heather to move forward. And Lord, tonight we just want to say we trust you with all, your, with all of our heart. 
We don't always understand it, but we trust you. We know you're God. We know this is right. And we just thank you for being such a good God. Thank you for the opportunity to be in church tonight for everybody that's been here. Lord, uh, bless Micheline's family as it seems like they're going to say goodbye to somebody they love tonight. Lord, may we be reminded to pray one for another. May we be reminded how much we mean to each other, how much we need each other. Dismiss us with your blessing tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being here tonight. Uh, the Wilsons are down here. I'm, I'm sure you got a lot of things you want to say. Uh, you're dismissed. We got a couple of folks. Johnny, good to see you tonight. Johnny visited Sunday. Bonjour. He's from Haiti. That's, that's my entire French vocabulary. I just used it all. Uh, but, and, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Ms. Weinshank, your mom's visiting from Virginia. And uh, thank you for being in the service tonight. And make sure you go over and greet this dear lady. God bless you. You are dismissed. Don't forget to go get your kids down in the uh, uh, children's program.